Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Justin White, a tobacco control researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. Tops is organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, and Mike Pesco from Georgia State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from Temple University to introduce our speaker. Today, we will continue our winter 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Dan Sachs, entitled Cigarette Taxes, Smoking and Health in the Long Run. Dan Sachs is an Associate Professor and Weimar Faculty Fellow in the Business, Economics and Public Policy Department, Kelly School of Business. He received his PhD in Applied Economics from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. His research spans health economics, public finance and industrial organization. In recent work, he studies the dynamics of addiction in opioids and nicotine, with a focus on understanding how policy can deter initiation. Our discussant today is Dr. Abby Friedman. So uh, Dr. Thank Dr. Sachs, thank you for presenting for us today. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for organizing this fantastic series. Um, and thank you all for your attention. The project that I'm presenting today is joint with several co-authors, Andrew Friedson at Colorado, Moyan Lee, who um, is a grad student here at Indiana University, Catherine Mackall at UC San Diego, Dan Reese in Madrid, and my name again is Dan Sachs. Um, before I begin, let me disclose that I have nothing to disclose. Uh, so despite the long list of co-authors, uh, we have no funding for the presented work and no tobacco-related funding over the last 10 years. Um, and I'll pause at a couple of points to um, respond to questions that um, I guess the moderator is collecting. I'll do that at the end of the background section and after discussing the methods. So the title of this project is Cigarette Taxes, Smoking, and Health in the Long Run. And indeed, we are interested in the long run consequences of um, smoking and cigarette taxes for health. Interest in the health hazards of cigarettes is longstanding, but Public attention to this topic exploded with the 1964 Surgeon General's report. That report uh, collated and presented a great deal of evidence accumulated over the prior 15 or 20 years, consistent with um, severe health costs of smoking. Following that report, there was an aggressive tobacco control effort in the United States and around the world. Um, and that effort took uh, many forms, but among the most important were cigarette taxes. So um, longstanding interest in um, cigarette taxes uh, as a tool for um, addressing the health consequences of smoking. Um, yet, despite the evidence in the Surgeon General's report and the great deal of accumulated evidence since then, uh, we think that the evidence on the long run effects of smoking for health, it, much of that evidence is potentially confounded. Uh, and we will argue why uh, during this talk. Broadly, the, the reason is most studies um, on the health consequences of smoking and the long run health consequences compare smokers to non-smokers with some limited control for observed differences between those groups. Yet smokers are likely to differ from non-smokers in ways that are both hard to observe and relevant for future health. So for one thing, smoking is a risky activity. So smokers may be less risk averse and engage in other risky activities. For another, we'll argue that People who engage in, in risky activities, including smoking, may be in worse health to begin with. So this is a potential confounding concern. Recent estimates that use economic models plus data on smoking and health to correct for um, selection into smoking on these unobserved factors, in fact, find smaller mortality effects of smoking than um, the prior literature. So what we're going to try and do in this paper is present new quasi-experimental evidence on the long run effects of tobacco control policy on both smoking and health. And the main advantage here is that we're gonna uh, avoid some of the difficulties that arise from directly comparing smokers and non-smokers. 
So we're specifically interested in the long run effects of cigarette taxes. Our research question is, what is the effect of teenage cigarette taxes on adult smoking and mortality? So we wanna take two people who um, appear similar, uh, but face different teenage taxes. And we're asking, how does that affect them years later in adulthood in terms of their smoking um, and mortality? The idea behind this research question is that we know from the prior literature that teenage taxes clearly influence teenage smoking. Teenage smoking decisions are sensitive to, to taxes. Further, most smoking initiation happens around the teenage years, typically by age 20, and teenage smoking is correlated with adult smoking. No surprise gear there given the addictiveness of nicotine. So the idea is that people who face higher teenage cigarette taxes might be less likely to smoke into adulthood and might um, enjoy better health and lower mortality. So adult smoking and mortality are the key long-run health outcomes that we're going to investigate. Our approach is to use quasi-experimental variation in cigarette taxes that arises from the fact that um, people born in different years and in different states will be subject to different state cigarette taxes during their teenage years. We will compare uh, people born across these states in birth cohorts facing these different uh, teenage taxes and look at how um, smoking and mortality co-vary. The advantage of this approach is that it avoids the confounding that arises from comparing smokers and non-smokers, although of course it has its own challenges. Uh, so we combine data from several sources. Our state cigarette tax data come from 70 years of um, tax burden on tobacco data. We link um, people's uh, teenage taxes to information on mortality from death certificate data, the universe of deaths from 1990 to 2018. Um, and we uh, link adult smoking decisions to teenage taxes using um, all waves of the tobacco use supplement of the current population survey. That's our data. Um, our estimation approach um, is designed to compare people subject to different teenage taxes, but um, adjusting as much as possible for uh, potential difference between people who face higher versus lower taxes. We use two-way fixed effects models. Um, so we have two sets of uh, detailed fixed effects. The first adjusts for cross-state heterogeneity. So any permanent cross-state differences that might be correlated with um, teenage taxes will be absorbed by these fixed effects. The second set of fixed effects uh, adjust for general trends in mortality. Those trends could arise um, both because uh, as a given cohort ages, um, mortality rates increase, but also as we look at more recent cohorts uh, that generally faced higher taxes, mortality rates have gone down um, as health has improved. And then we control for a rich set of additional uh, factors as well. The key assumption that lets us interpret our estimates in a causal way is that the state-specific timing of when they raise their teenage taxes is uncorrelated with um, pre-existing state-level trends in cohort uh, smoking and mortality. Okay, so what do we find? Our first result is that teenage taxes reduce adult smoking. Adult smoking is, is sensitive to teenage taxes. Each $1 higher tax experienced um, over ages 14 to 17, those are our teenage years, reduces adult smoking by 1.7 percentage points. So there's a lot of evidence already that um, teenage smoking is sensitive to teenage taxes. What's um, new here is that adult smoking is sensitive to the taxes that people faced when they were teenagers. We actually have a, a separate uh, companion paper, my co-authors and I do, that explores this result and the persistence of teenage smoking in much more detail. Our focus in this paper is um, the health consequences, in particular mortality. Our second finding is that adult mortality is also sensitive to teenage taxes. So each $1 higher teenage taxes reduces adult mortality by uh, about 20 deaths per 100,000 per year. That's a reduction of 4%. Those reductions are concentrated among men and among smoking-related causes of death as defined by the CDC. So a smoking-related cause of death um, is like lung cancer most, most prominently, but it's a fairly broad set of causes. We also find that um, for the health uh, consequences of taxes, the teenage years are special. We find no effect of um, taxes on adult mortality when those taxes are experienced at earlier ages, so one to 10, or somewhat later ages, 20 to 24. So those are our main results. Um, I wanna highlight two implications. Uh, the first is we're, we're studying um, cigarette taxes that were enacted 
really throughout the 20th century. Our results say that um, the rising cigarette taxes over this time period has produced long lasting gains, longer um, than you would have found if you just looked at the effects today on mortality today, because um, taxes today uh, not only uh, reduce smoking today, but they also reduce the smoking in the future and the mortality in the future of today's teenagers. Um, we think more broadly, our results point to potentially important long run health benefits of controlling teenage smoking in general, um, not necessarily just through taxes. Okay, that's the big picture. I hope you have a sense of where we're going. Um, now I wanna spend a few minutes on sort of background and what's known about this topic. And in fact, a great deal is known about um, smoking, health and mortality. So what I really wanna do here is explain why we think there's anything left to learn about cigarettes and health. So to do that, um, let me review what I think of as um, the main evidence on uh, smoking and health in the long run. And I should acknowledge that um, I'm a bit of an outsider to this field. So it's very possible that I've left off an important stream of evidence. Um, if that's true, I would love to hear about it. Please um, leave a comment or send me an email um, explaining what I missed. So the early evidence here found clear associations between smoking and cancer and smoking and mortality. The very first papers um, were case control studies comparing the smoking rates of people with lung cancer um, to the smoking rates of other cancer patients. Uh, and the finding was that smoking was clearly associated with lung cancer. Follow-up work um, surveyed people and uh, followed them to assess the association over a few year horizon between smoking and mortality. Um, and that work also found an association between smoking and mortality. Some of those um, uh, early prospective studies turned into um, very large scale and very long running cohort studies uh, confirming the smoking mortality association. So for me, one of the most impressive studies in this area or really that I've seen in social science is the British doctor study, which tracked um, all physicians in England since 1950 till today, basically. Um, and over a very long time period, we see a very clear, strong association between smoking and mortality. More recent work follows in that vein, uh, but links um, health interview surveys to death certificate data. Um, and the health interview surveys um, give a richer set of uh, covariates to adjust for potential differences between smokers and non-smokers. So they adjust for things like age, um, urbanicity, adiposity, sometimes health behaviors. Um, okay, so I think this literature has established a very strong link between smoking and mortality. Um, mainly by comparing smokers to non-smokers and adjusting um, for observed differences in mortality predictors. But what this literature leaves open is the possibility still of unobserved uh, confounding factors. And here we mean things that are difficult or impossible really to, to capture um, with survey measures. So these could be things like risk tolerance. Um, we might think that people who smoke um, just engage in a wide array of risky behaviors. Uh, it could be baseline health beyond sort of comorbidities that are captured. But controlling for baseline health is a tricky um, proposition because um, many health, many comorbidities such as hypertension um, are endogenous outcomes, that they're influenced by smoking. So what we'd really like to do is um, measure health at the time of smoking initiation, but that's typically hard. And then a final confounding factor is um, uh, whether you initiate smoking or engage in any kind of risky behavior might depend on um, your own personal expectations about your future health and life expectancy. Um, if you think that you are going to die young, you have little reason to be careful about your health. Um, so these are all sort of theoretical possibilities, but um, prior literature, in fact, gives some support for this uh, challenge of unobserved confounding. In particular, um, people who seem to have greater genetic exposure to disease in the sense that their parents um, died young, those people themselves smoke more. Uh, for another, at the time of smoking initiation, smokers appear less healthy on multiple dimensions. And then finally, as I mentioned, model-based efforts um, to address unobserved confounding generally find smaller mortality effects of smoking than does the observational literature. These efforts combine economic models uh, of behavior with um, data on smoking and health to um, address unobserved confounding. Okay, so how do we contribute 
Well, our main result is to show that there's long run effects of tobacco, smoke, uh, tobacco taxes on both adult smoking and mortality. And we think this evidence is important for two reasons. First, it's indirect evidence on the health consequences of smoking that avoids the problem uh, of confounding arising from comparing smokers and non-smokers. Um, so we don't wanna throw out that prior evidence. We think that's important, useful evidence. Um, our evidence avoids one particular challenge that that literature faces. So we think um, our results complement the large scale long running studies. We think um, they also complement the uh, model based approaches that I highlighted a moment ago. Those approaches are valid under one set of assumptions, mainly behavioral and statistical assumptions. Our approach is valid under a different set of assumptions. So it's complementary. Um, separately, we think our, our results represent a contribution because um, we think that it's uh, the first evidence on the long run effects of cigarette taxes on health. So um, some papers have shown short run um, mortality reductions from today's uh, taxes, reduced mortality rates today. We show long run effects uh, a, that people who face um, higher taxes as teenagers have a lower mortality in the future. Um, there's also some work on um, the effects of teenage cigarette taxes on smoking into early adulthood, um, which uh, we, we contribute in this area at all, looking at um, a wider range of ages and using alternative statistical approaches. Okay, so let me pause now um, to take questions. Thanks so much, Dan, for this really great talk. Um, I think I'll give our discussant, Abby, the opportunity to ask her questions. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, Dan, and for the opportunity to, to discuss this and also to look at this paper. It's really very interesting. Um, I had two questions that I wanted to kind of start off with, and then I want to make sure that, that if there's a question in the Q&A that we need to address that we get to that. So the first is there is some recent research that's starting to call the idea that youth are more responsive or particularly responsive to cigarette taxes into question. And of course, it's entirely possible that the elasticities have changed over time so that the elasticity of a potential initiator looks different now than it did maybe in the 1970s or 1980s. How would that kind of change affect your estimates? And to what extent should we be concerned that the results that you have here may not actually generalize if there has been a change in the way that youths respond to cigarette taxes? Um, so good, yes. The As I understand this literature, um, the one set of estimates looked at um, how cigarette tax increases um, throughout the 1990s affected teenage smoking. Um, and then more recent work has asked, um, there were very large cigarette tax increases following the master settlement agreement um, from 1998 to the present. Um, and those large, more recent tax changes seem to have produced um, smaller changes in teenage smoking rates. So um, I think there's two potential challenges here for us. One is um, uh, whether that affects the validity of our estimates for the population we study. Um, and we think it doesn't. So we are looking at um, kind of earlier cohorts who experienced um, these tax changes in the 1990s and much earlier. Um, so this is sort of the period when sensitivity to taxes seemed high. The second concern though, is about whether we can generalize from our findings. Um, you know, generalizing out of sample is always a fraught endeavor. I think it's, um, plausible from this um, research that future tax changes might not have as large mortality benefits as the past ones. However, um, if you look at what states increased their taxes during the late 90s and early 2000s, they were mostly states that already had high taxes. So one interpretation of um, this result on following teenage tax sensitivity is that in some places, the taxes are already so high, there's little scope for improvement. But in other states, taxes are still near zero, in fact. Um, and it's possible that increasing um, taxes away from zero could have a, a meaningful effect on youth smoking in, in those states. I think that's an empirical question um, that I would love for someone to, to answer, but um, how our results sort of extrapolate to the future definitely depends on where the tax changes happen um, and how sensitive teenagers are uh, in those places. Great answer. And there are a few um, Q and A's that kind of touch on this. Someone asked about Tobacco 21, and I think a related concept is whether or not the master settlement agreements per se had an effect on people's understanding of the risks from tobacco that in turn may have affected their behavior. Um, but your generalizability comment, I believe, probably covers that. Uh, 
Catherine, would you prefer that I ask another question or should we defer to the Q&A? If you'd like to ask another one, that's just great. And then we'll move on to the Q&A, your call. Um, so I'm gonna ask a question that in theory I would ask later, but I think it's good to talk about now, which is you're talking about effects on smoking, but you haven't actually broken that into the difference between initiation, cessation, or for that matter, the distinction between first trying a cigarette and actually initiating a habit. Um, can you talk a little bit about how those distinctions play in or don't play in and perhaps why they don't play into the paper? Because I think it is a very different discussion to talk about tax effects on cessation, which implicitly is happening a little later versus at teenage years when we're talking about experimentation and possibly habitual initiation. Thank you. Um, I uh, won't have much more to say about this, so I'm, I'm happy to address it now. So. The way that I think about our results is um, we're, we're pulling a lever over here during your teenage years, and we're looking at what happens all the way over here um, in kind of later adulthood. And there's a lot of stuff that can change along the way. Um, the simplest version of what happens when you increase teenage taxes is that um, you simply prevent some teenagers from ever initiating, and nothing else ever changes. And some of those people whom you prevented from initiating um, would have smoked and would have died because of their smoking, and, and you prevent that mortality. In, in practice, I suspect the dynamics are much more complicated than that, um, that you may um, not just prevent some people from initiating at all, but they initiate a little bit less, um, or they don't become quite as um, addicted during their teenage years. It's easier for them to quit during adulthood, or they maintain a lower habit during adulthood. I think in, in the paper that I'm showing you today, we don't really rule out any of those mechanisms. Our results are kind of averaging over all those different dynamic paths. So in our companion paper, we try to explore this um, a, a bit more, although I think still we have really nailed down kind of people um, initiating, then lapsing, then relapse, or quitting, then, then relapsing. Um, great, I wanna highlight a question by Yiwei Duan, whose name I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, I'm sorry. Um, they asked if it's possible that the individuals who expect themselves to die young will be over, will be more, be more risk averse and thus will live longer. So specifically, I think the example they're talking about is if your parent has lung cancer, so you don't smoke, compensating. There, there's a flip side of that that I also want yeah. to put in there is if, if people are responding to their parents and parents who smoke live in areas with lower taxes, couldn't the entire exercise be confounded by the relationship between parental and use? use? Good. So let me um, take those in turn. Um, so actually, I'll, I'll back up. Um, this idea um, that people with greater um, uh, exposure to disease for sort of genetic factors or exogenous reasons um, might engage in riskier behavior more broadly, I think is both super interesting and underexplored. So this paper I cite here calls it the Mickey Mantle effect. Um, Mickey Mantle, as you may know, was an all-star baseball player who um, uh, also uh, drank and smoked a ton and his career was cut short in part as a complication from alcoholism. And in a um, uh, interviews, he reveals that um, everyone in his family died young for reasons unrelated to um, smoking or alcoholism. And so he just thought he was going to die young also. So the mechanism here is really like not that you have a particular incentive to be careful around cigarettes, but that like um, you have other genetic predispositions. I, I agree in principle that um, uh, if you're genetically, um, uh, if your genetics make it so that smoking is very risky for you, you might expect even less behavior on, on that dimension. Um, okay, so that was the, the first question. You raised a question around confounding um, from uh, the fact that um, maybe if you face high teenage taxes, that means when you were a teenager, your parents faced higher taxes, and so maybe they smoked less. Maybe that's the mechanism. Um, in principle, that could be the mechanism, and actually that's consistent with long-run benefits of teenage taxes. It, it comes through a very different channel than the one we've highlighted. Um, we can't totally rule it out, but I'll show you some evidence that I think is inconsistent with it, which is that the health benefits of taxes um, uh, 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 early in life um, come from teenage taxes and not taxes at younger ages. So if it was all from sort of your parents' behavior, I would think that um, the taxes your parents faced when you were one to 10 also, also matters. Thanks so much. Um, that's great. And Abby, thanks for drawing out some of those great questions. I think what we'll do now is we'll just get back to the presentation, but uh, thanks for the questions and comments. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about our data. 
Um, and uh, the, some of our specification choices and, and sample choices are dictated by the chronology of uh, when people are born and when they die. So I want to highlight how like the chronology lines up with our data sources. So we start with um, state cigarette taxes compiled by the tax burden on tobacco. Um, those data that we have begin in 1950. Um, and let me say, I, I see that there's a lot of people in the room who know a lot about um, cigarettes and cigarette taxes. If anyone knows how to get reliable data on earlier cigarette taxes, I would love to hear about it. I know that the first state cigarette taxes went into effect in the 1920s, but I haven't been able to figure out what they are. Okay, so we start with these um, 68 years of state cigarette tax data. We're interested in the taxes people faced as teenagers. So if we define teenage years as ages 14 to 17, um, uh, that means we can look at people who were born as early as 1936 and in principle as late as 2001 and still observe their teenage taxes. This is our main regressor. Um, our outcomes are death certificate uh, deaths on death certificate data and adult smoking, which we measure in the um, tobacco use supplement of the current population survey. Uh, we're gonna start with the 1990 death certificate data. We don't look earlier because there was a major redesign um, just prior to this, and we wanna continue this data series. Uh, and these data we have going through 2018. Um, I guess I should mention prior to 2005, um, the geocoded versions of the death certificates are publicly available, but after that, we use the restricted access versions so we um, know the state of death. Um, so of course, these data start much later than our tax data, but you know, typically people die later in life, so this isn't a huge concern for us. Uh, our um, adult smoking data temporally coincide with the death data, so we're looking at adult smoking. Um, the tobacco use supplement of the current population survey is a, a large-scale nationally representative survey that runs every three to four years. Um, so we have all the waves between 92 and 2018. We have some additional data sources that we use to bring in state level covariates like the unemployment rate, um, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna dwell on those. So to um, line up uh, the birth cohorts where we observe teenage taxes, or the birth cohorts where we observe adult outcomes, we're gonna limit the sample to 1936 to 1998. Um, so we stop in people born in 1998, so we observe you um, at 20. Uh, we're going to restrict our sample to 20-year-olds, um, so we have a clean separation between adults and uh, teenagers. Okay, um, so our main uh, regressor, as I said, is teenage taxes, teenage cigarette taxes. We define these taxes as the inflation-adjusted average state cigarette tax that a person faces between 14 and 17. We look at state cigarette taxes because um, for a given birth year, there's no variation in the federal tax that you face. Everyone faces the same federal tax, of course. So what we would like to do is match um, these teenage taxes to adult um, outcomes, so mortality or smoking, using the state where people li actually lived as teenagers. Unfortunately, neither the death certificate data nor the um, tobacco use data record teenage residents. So instead, we match people to their adult residents. Basically what we do is impute your teenage and in fact life cycle taxes, assuming um, no mobility at all, assuming you never move. So for example, I was born in Massachusetts in 1986. I live in Indiana now. So we would impute my tax as the tax that was in effect in Indiana when I was 14 to 17. So when I was, uh, so that's 2000 to 2003. Um, we average over those four years. Um, so. This approach uh, introduces measurement error. Obviously, I didn't live in Indiana then, um, or maybe it's not obvious, but I didn't live in Indiana then. Um, in Indiana and Massachusetts had different taxes then. That measurement error means um, that our key regressor, uh, well, um, is measured with error. And it's likely that our estimates, if anything, are attenuated, meaning they're too close to zero, too, too small. So there's some bias from it, but it actually biases us against finding mortality or smoking effects. Um, okay, so variation in teenage taxes is going to be critical. We want to compare people um, expo experiencing different teenage taxes. So let me show you how these tax rates have varied over time. Um, this panel on the left shows um, the average state cigarette tax in real $2,005 per pack since 1950. And I find it helpful to divide this up into um, four eras. Between 1950 and 1971, 
many states implemented their first um, cigarette taxes, um, and taxes rose by about uh, one cent per year per pack, which, um, since they started off at a low base, was fairly fast, 4%. Between 72 and 81, few states adjusted their nominal tax, and this was an era of high inflation. So real taxes declined by three cents per pack per year, or about 7%. Actually, so cigarette taxes declined substantially over this time period. By the early 80s, uh, Volcker got inflation under control, and um, the average state did not change its tax as much. So for about 20 years, taxes were kind of stagnant. Um, and then in the last 20 years, after the Master Settlement Agreement, there have been very large increases um, in cigarette taxes for some states, about five cents per year per pack and uh, almost 6% yearly growth. Um, okay, so this is average growth, but um, our approach is gonna control for any common general trend. So all of our comparisons essentially involve people um, uh, born in the same year, but experiencing different teenage taxes um, relative to um, people born in earlier or later years. So what's critical is not only average state growth, but actually the variation around that average. And on the right here, uh, I'm showing the distribution of tax changes. Distribution across states, tax changes from the beginning of one of these periods to the end. So um, in the first era, the average state increased its taxes by 30 cents per pack, but um, some states had large changes, some states had zero or even negative changes. In the 72 to 81 period, the average uh, state had a decline, um, but some states had very large declines and some states had no declines. Uh, similarly, in the um, third period, uh, the average change was fairly small, but, but some states had increases of 50 cents a pack or bigger. And then most strikingly in the last 20 years, um, the average state had a very large tax increase, but that's driven by some states increasing their taxes by one to 250 per pack. Other states actually did not change their taxes at all. Okay, so this um, kind of within uh, era cross state variation is, is going to be important um, in cross state variation, the size of the change. So um, let me tell you how we form our analysis sample. We have two samples, one for smoking using the um, tobacco use supplement and one for mortality. For both samples, um, we limit uh, to people born between 1936 and 1998, um, at least 20 years old at the time they're surveyed or the time they die. Uh, and we limit to people born in the U.S. Uh, the reason we look at U.S. born is that, remember, we're imputing the taxes you face as a teenager based on your adult state of residence. For people born outside of the U.S., it's less likely, we think, that their state of residence um, is where they lived as a teenager. Uh, when we work with the smoking data, the tobacco use supplement data, we use the micro data. So just everything is individual level. Our main outcome here is an indicator for smoking someday or every day although we've also looked at kind of other margins of smoking. Uh, the mortality data consists of the universe of death certificates. Um, it's not practical or really useful to work with individual level death certificates. So we aggregate to cells um, defined by um, uh, state, year of birth, um, and year of death. And sometimes uh, we look uh, separately at male and female. Um, for each of these cells, we get the 1990 population count. So a cell would be like born um, in New York in 1950, died in 2000. Um, and then our population count is how many people in the 1990 census were born in New York in 1950. Our main outcome is deaths per 100,000 denominated by that 1990 population. Okay, so methods. Um, what we would like to do, as I've said, is compare people who face different teenage taxes, but are otherwise similar um, on average in terms of um, the determinants of mortality or adult smoking. Um, so we design a regression that tries to uh, facilitate that comparison. We think of this regression as isolating quasi-experimental variation in taxes. Okay, so the simplest thing you could do is regress some outcome Y uh, for person I in, in year T on the teenage tax that was in effect um, for that person in, in their state. Alpha one, we'd like to be, uh, we'd like to interpret as the effect of $1 greater teenage taxes on our adult outcomes, on mortality or on smoking. There are many challenges, <laughs> many, many problems with this simple regression. So we're gonna enrich it um, in several ways. First, we add two sets of fixed effects. Mu S is a state fixed effect. 
which controls for any permanent cross-state difference in um, the outcome. Uh, and second, we have a set of fixed effects for um, general trends in smoking or in mortality. The um, trend fixed effects are a set of uh, fixed effects for birth year by age. So this is a dummy variable for like born in 1950 by 50 years old. This controls for both um, uh, aging effects in mortality or smoking and cohort effects. And it also includes uh, controls for a general time trend because time is collinear with birth year by age. Um, we further control for state specific um, linear deviations from these trends. Next, we add um, a control for adult taxes. That's because people who face higher teenage taxes may just have been born in a high tax state, and so they may also um, face higher adult taxes. So um, we're primarily interested in this teenage um, tax channel. So we're going to control for the tax in effect in year T. Then finally, we add um, some additional controls, uh, both individual characteristics and state level uh, covariates. The point of the individual controls is primarily to improve power. We don't, we're, we're not concerned about confounding on that dimension. Um, the state level controls include both um, economic conditions like unemployment, which might be related to, to smoking. Um, and also we control for a set of tobacco related policy variables. Uh, so the minimum legal purchase age um, in effect at time T and in effect when you were a teenager and um, the presence of comprehensive um, clean air laws and I will explain why we um, control for this. Okay, so this approach um, has a rich set of controls. It uh, compares uh, people born in different years and states who therefore experience different teenage taxes. Um, and that comparison does not condition on smoking explicitly. That's how we solve the confounding problem. Nonetheless, you might have several um, potential concerns. So let me explain how we address them. Uh, first concern is confounding from anti-tobacco sentiment. Um, so this is a long-standing concern in the literature on um, cigarette taxes and smoking. The concern is that states that have higher cigarette taxes might just in general be opposed to um, tobacco. Certainly many of the low um, tax states uh, are, are tobacco producing states. We address this concern in two ways. Um, first, we include uh, state fixed effects, which control for permanent cross-state differences, including like capacity for growing tobacco. Um, second, our controls for other tobacco legislation, and in particular, the, um, an index of um, clean air laws, um, has been taken to be uh, a proxy for anti-tobacco sentiment. So to the extent that anti-tobacco sentiment changes over time, it's not captured by our state fixed effects, uh, but we hope that this uh, sort of proxy variable through other regulation um, gets at that concern. Second, you might be worried about confounding trends in either smoking or mortality. Smoking is decreasing across cohorts and over time, mortality until very recently, decreasing over time. Um, and at the same time, taxes are increasing. So if we didn't control for the trend, that would be, uh, could, could generate spurious correlation. Uh, we address this through our, our rich uh, fixed effects for the trends. Um, two more concerns um, you might have are attenuation bias from measurement error in um, teenage taxes. We think that's real. We tried to address that um, in how we constructed our sample. Um, if we didn't perfectly address it, then there's likely some bias in our um, uh, teenage tax effect, but that bias is towards zero. So if anything, our estimates could be too small. And then a final concern, which Abby mentioned, um, is that many adult smokers um, try to quit or quit but relapse. Um, and uh, that kind of dynamic is not explicitly captured in our model. Um, that's true. The way that we think about that is that um, our estimates are coming from representative samples of the the population, representative cross sections, who um, the people in our samples are sort of at different points um, in this like life cycle profile of dynamics. So some of them started as teenagers and are still smoking. Some of them started as teenagers but quit at some point, and some of them are uh, just never smoked. We're going to get estimates that average over all those groups. Uh, okay, so let me pause again. Uh, thanks, Dan. I will go to our discussant and see if there's some comments, then we'll move to the uh, Q&A to hear our audience. Hi again. Um, so I'm going to try to ask questions that get at themes that are in the Q&A questions here. And one thing we're seeing repeatedly are questions about migration. And I think there was both questions about, well, maybe people don't live where they were born, which is obviously 
a question that could be an issue here, but more, more of a threat to identification would be if there was selective migration. So specifically for the deaths analysis, if people who smoke move to states with more lenient tobacco policies than people who don't smoke, then you would expect the more restrictive tobacco policies to be associated with lower mortality just by virtue of selective migration. I think the rate right now is that about 40% of US residents live in a state they weren't born in. So Dan, can you talk to us a little bit about the concerns about migration and the analysis, whether it's more of an issue or less of an issue for one of the, for either the mortality or the smoking analysis and how you think about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so let me uh, tackle sort of this in two ways. Um, so the um, first is sort of generally how much measurement error might we expect in the teen tax rate? Um, and to think about this question, um, what you want to know is like, what's the signal to noise ratio for our bad measure of the teen tax relative to the truth? Um, and so it's not necessarily a problem if people move across state lines. Um, if, if you move from Massachusetts to New York, which have sort of fairly similar tax histories, then your imputed and actual teenage tax will be fairly similar. It's a bigger problem if you move from like Massachusetts to Virginia. Um, so using other smaller scale data sets that let us follow people from their teenage years into adulthood, so the PSID and the NLSY, we've tried to estimate the signal to noise ratio and it's closer to 0 0.8 um, than the sort of 0 0.6 you would get if you thought about 40% of people have, have moved. Um, so, that 0.8 suggests our, our results are um, understated by um, about 20%. Um, to the selected, so th that's from pure classical measurement error. Uh, the selective migration concern is um, uh, raises a possibility of non-classical measurement error. So the sort of mismeasurement is correlated with unobserved components of mortality. Um, it turns out we can do a little bit better on imputing teenage taxes than I initially suggested. Um, and that's because the death certificate data but not the adult smoking data, the death certificate data contain state of birth. So we can instead impute your um, teenage taxes using your state of birth rather than your state of death. That avoids, I think, the selective migration concern, although it's still potentially mismeasured. People can move from you know, age zero to age 14. Um, we get very similar results in the death certificate data when we use um, uh, state of birth for imputing taxes. The reason that we um, lead with uh, state of death is for consistency with the adult smoking results. Okay. Um, and I will mention as an aside, there are later years of the CPS where they asked the state you lived in where you first tried or first smoked regularly. So in theory, if you wanted to extrapolate later, you could actually look at how often the state that you first tried it in was the state you were born in. Versus Thank the you. State you were in an interview. I don't think I was aware of that. So we should look into it. Of course, we would also it's need to know. Late, it's like the 11, 2011, 2010, I think, and 2014, 2015. It's not every year, but you could, yeah. you could check. We would need to know um, that for non-smokers also is the, the challenge, but there might be useful information just on sort of the migration behaviors of smokers. Like do smokers move to low tax states? I yeah. think we could answer with that question. You could also look at the former smokers versus the continued smokers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, the, another question that came up here, which I think we're going to have to circle back to at the end also, because it will help to see your, your results. Um, Reginald Hebert asked, can you speak briefly about the potential welfare consequences of these results? So specifically in terms of policy, if we're thinking about quantifying the benefits of present day policy, but the bite is from lag policies. How do we think about that um, in terms of current welfare discussions? Um, so I, I think there's sort of two components of this. One is how would we quantify for today the potential long-run benefits that we're documenting? And then um, to my economist ears, at least, um, the word welfare has a special meaning separate from health benefits. Um, in, in, so the first part, I think the short answer is um, the uh, benefits are bigger. Um, they, they come later. I don't have like a number for you of how to scale them up by you know, 25% or 50% like that. I don't, I don't have a number. However big you think they are, the health benefits, um, based on the sort of short run responses, our results say they're, they're even bigger than that. Separate is the welfare question. Um, to some economists, at least, um, it's hard to know the welfare uh, benefits of, of cigarette taxes because there's some cost to smokers of either paying the tax or being deterred from smoking. Um, in my view, our results say that the... Um, 1950s to, to 
2000 tax increases um, uh, had big health benefits. And at least some of the people that were studying probably initiated smoking um, prior to the Surgeon General's report, prior to like really widespread understanding of the health costs. Um, so if you deter someone who is uninformed about the costs of smoking, that seems like purely a, a welfare win. Um, so I don't really want to, I don't think our results let us wade into like a literal sort of um, valuation to, to smokers of the cigarettes they smoke. Um, but certainly the long run health benefits and the total health benefits um, are bigger than we would have thought from, from just sort of short run estimates. Okay, I'm gonna bring up one more and then I think we probably should move on for time. I'm checking with Catherine to make sure I'm right about that. Um, so because you've just brought this up with the idea about um, the sentiment, we do know if you look at Gallup data from the mid 20th century, we know that there was differential changes in different populations and the perception that cigarettes were harmful. Mother, regardless of what the scientific community knew, the majority of the American community didn't match the scientific community. And those numbers look different across states. So you said that you're controlling for other tobacco legislation, but smoke-free air laws didn't come in until well, well after taxes did. Are you, are you actually controlling for any legislation that was concurrent with the 1960s, 40s, 50s, tax rates, or are we actually really just depending on the, the assumption that there weren't differences between states where people were more likely to believe that smoking was harmful and the tax rates in yeah. state versus states where they were less likely to believe that? So currently, um, I, we address this in, in three ways. I think none of them totally satisfying to your concern. Um, so first, as you mentioned, is these um, uh, clean air laws, which like I agree, are you're, you're correct, They're, they they become common in the 1990s. They wouldn't um, reflect changing sentiment early. Um, to the extent that sentiment is, um, except the 1990s changes, to the extent that, that sentiment is like roughly constant across states for our sample period, um, then our state fixed effects will capture it. As you pointed out, there were differential reactions across states to Surgeon General's report and other emerging information. Um, we do have some other um, regulations, primarily uh, minimum legal purchase ages. I don't have a strong reason to think that those fully capture your concern. We could do better probably by um, just bringing in that Gallup data directly. Um, and you know, when in fact we put together a bunch of Gallup polls on sort of smoking during this time period, it may well have exactly this information. Thank you both so much for these comments. I think we better get back to the presentation. I think we've got about uh, 12 minutes or so left, so. Uh, thank you for these great comments. Okay. Great. Um, so let me show you some results. Uh, so our first result is that teenage taxes reduce adult smoking. Um, so uh, as I said, we have a companion paper which explores this in more detail. Um, our estimate is that each $1 increase in teenage taxes reduces adult smoking by 1.7 percentage points. Um, and we find fairly similar reductions for men and for women. Um, the average adult smoking rate in our sample um, is about 23%. Um, and these results imply an elasticity of adult smoking with respect to the teenage tax of minus 0.06. That's much smaller than the elasticity of teenage smoking with respect to the teenage tax. But that's no surprise. What this says is um, some of the reductions in teenage smoking fade out by adulthood over, over a longer run that, that um, uh, relationship between smoking and teenage taxes starts to attenuate. Um, okay, our primary results are um, about adult mortality. So um, when we pool men and women, uh, we find that each $1 increase in teenage taxes reduces um, adult mortality by 20 per 100,000. That's a reduction of about 4%. That reduction um, is much larger for men than for women. For men, there's a 35 per 100,000 reduction. For women, um, negative seven, statistically insignificant. Um, partly men, um, I'm sorry to say, I guess, die more often than women, uh, and that's why we find bigger effects, although also in percent terms, um, the reduction for men is bigger than for women. Here we're looking at all causes of death. Um, we can look at causes of death that are just smoking related, which is um, a fairly broad set of conditions defined by the CDC, which um, medical literature has identified as sort of plausibly caused connected to smoking. So most prominently, um, lung cancer, heart disease, but it's actually much broader than that. We find that about 80% of the reduction in all-cause mortality is coming from smoking-related mortality. 
you might think, since we're looking at cigarette taxes, that all of the reduction in mortality should be smoking related. So what's that extra 20%? Well, there are ways that smoking can kill you even if it's not literally a smoking related cause of death. So for example, um, we know that uh, smokers today are at greater um, risk of dying from COVID-19 if they get it. So if you're a smoker and you die of COVID-19, that wouldn't be classified as smoking related mortality, even though if you hadn't been a smoker, um, there's some chance that you would have lived. So that's kind of the difference between these 16 deaths versus 20 deaths. Um, nonetheless, um, I think it would be reassuring to know that um, certain causes of death, which are obviously unrelated to smoking, do not respond to teenage cigarette taxes. And indeed, that's what we find. So we look at two placebo causes of death, which are homicides and accidents, except fires. Um, so we don't expect teenage cigarette taxes to affect mortality from homicides or mortality from like car accidents. Um, and indeed, we find that they do not. Uh, so the um, estimated effect of teen taxes on these placebo causes of death is small and statistically insignificant. And by the way, it's not like these are trivial causes of death, um, you know, 45, 46 per 100,000. Um, th this uh, is comparable to um, the uh, mortality rates from certain cancers, for example. Okay, the last result um, I want to show you um, is that teenage taxes in particular um, have long run mortality impacts. So to show you that, I'm going to change our um, specification a little bit. And I'm going to look at um, not only the effect of teenage taxes, but taxes at other ages. So teenage taxes are now taxed at ages 11 to 19. And then we also look at taxes at ages um, early adulthood, I guess, 20 to 24, and then pre-teenage taxes, one to 10. Um, and here now we're expanding, the, uh, we're limiting the sample to people 25 and older. So um, these are all uh, sort of relatively long run effects. Um, and what we can see is that the, the coefficient on um, the teenage taxes is um, uniquely large and, and the only statistically significant one. Um, so taxes at other ages are generally smaller, um, sometimes noisier and, and statistically insignificant. So Abby, this is why I said um, uh, it doesn't seem like this is just about or even necessarily primarily about the sort of home environment. The taxes during your younger years um, just, just don't matter. Uh, okay. Um, so we um, have explored the robustness of these results to um, several alternative adjacent approaches, such as um, alternative sets of controls, um, education, uh, so dropping controls, adding controls, um, defining the teenage years differently, actually many more choices than this, um, robust across all these, other specifications and functional forms. And then in our companion data set, um, a companion paper, we look at the persistence of teenage smoking and the long-run effects of teenage taxes on adult smoking and a bunch of other data sets, um, generally very similar results across these alternative choices. Okay, so to wrap up, um, we investigated the um, health and smoking consequences of state cigarette taxes that were enacted over the last 70 years. We know from prior work that they reduced smoking at the time they went into effect, um, especially among teenagers and especially the older taxes. What we've shown today um, is that these taxes continue to reduce smoking even decades later among people who were exposed to them as teenagers. Um, those same cohorts uh, had lower mortality as a result of the higher taxes also. And finally, taxes at other ages have um, less pronounced long-run health effects. So the broader implication here, we think, um, is that there's long-lasting consequences of um, cigarette taxes and possibly also tobacco control policy in general. Um, therefore, we see potential health benefits from reducing teenage cigarette use. Um, and as I mentioned um, to Abby, Average state taxes are high right now, so you might think there's sort of little benefit from increasing them further, and indeed, maybe for the high tax states, there are not large benefits. Nonetheless, many states currently have low tax rates, um, uh, and so our results uh, point to benefits, health benefits from um, raising those uh, taxes. Okay, thank you uh, very much, and I guess we have a few minutes for discussion. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Jan, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, Abby, if you have a question, uh, that would be great. And then maybe we'll have a few minutes for the audience questions. So I'm going to riff off of the audience questions so that people get as many of their questions answered as possible. We've got several questions in here about income. Now, I know you probably don't have any way of knowing the income level from the death certificate data. 
Um, but it is an interesting question whether or not the these impacts were higher for low income families or teens who were low income when they were teens than for those who were higher SES, whether it be by income or some parental education measure. Can you tell us anything about that or how would you think about that? Because I think that does have implications when we think about whether these taxes actually aren't regressive at all, which is commonly the economic argument that's made because of these long-term benefits that might happen if you never take up. Right, so I guess the short answer is, um, I wish I could tell you things about this, um, but I, I can't yet. Um, it's a tantalizing possibility to me that um, the reason that cigarette taxes have become less effective per dollar is that um, as a share of the pack price, they've gone down, and especially as a share of like teenager income, um, they've gone way down. That seems totally plausible. Um, we have not investigated it at all. It, it, it might be something that we can look into with our data. I think it's a very interesting possibility. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have results to share on that. Um, uh, the second question was around the um, uh, sort of progressivity or regressivity of these taxes. And I agree that to understand that, you want to know not just sort of the incomes of the, the, incomes of the people who pay the taxes, but also um, the incomes of the people who benefit from the um, possible corrections of um, mistakes or health problems that the taxes create. Um, we don't have, uh, I'd like to know that too. Let, let, let me leave it at that. I think that would be interesting. Um, I guess <laughs> to plug someone else's work. So Hunt Alcott has a couple of papers that I, I really love about um, how to think about welfare and uh, progressivity of taxes that correct mistakes, like possibly mistakenly consuming cigarettes or soda taxes. Um, and I would love to see sort of, I think that those are great papers and I'd love to see that framework applied to, to these questions. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I would too. <laughs> That's it's really interesting. And I think it's another call for really good deep dive historical work that uses these long periods like you all have. Um, we've got a question in here from, and I'm kind of taking two questions by Mike Cummings and turning them into one, um, which is, does this mean that taxes are actually more effective as a preventative measure than they are in terms of benefit from cessation? Or can we not actually draw that conclusion here? Um, I don't think you can quite directly draw it from, um, because I haven't really shown you the sort of on the, the, the cessation effects, um, uh, which are a bit noisier. Um, I don't think you can directly draw it from, from this paper. I, I will say, my read of the literature um, is consistent with that interpretation in the sense that um, for sure, there is a statistically significant reduction in um, adult smoking when taxes go up. But the magnitude of that is not very large, um, which I interpret to mean it's just quite hard to, to quit smoking and that the cessation effects are not huge. Historically, the initiation effects have been much bigger. Um, that's sort of Implicit in our results, we, we highlight that interpretation in our companion paper around smoking and persistence. Um, and that's what you can see from sort of the teenage um, tax responsiveness literature. So I think that interpretation is, is right. And it's something that we push more in our companion paper. Um, but I think it's, it doesn't quite follow because I haven't shown you um, the on impact effect on adults, but it, which, which is noisy is the problem. Which makes complete sense. Um, are we keeping to the 1 p.m. or are we going an extra few minutes, Catherine? We've got a couple more minutes if you'd like to ask, ask a question or two. I have a faculty meeting at 1 p.m., so please ask oh. as many questions please. as you want. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure if that meant we had to stop or we should just keep you as long as possible. I, I, a couple minutes, I think I can 1 do. No, yeah, yeah, a couple minutes, please, like one or two more. Um, so, so there's a question that's asked here, which I think I know the answer to for your study, but I'm going to ask you to kind of ponder. Um, Christian Sands asked whether people are going to substitute away from cigarettes to products like cigars or chew. Now, obviously, because at least cigars and cigarillos, a lot of the health effects are similar in terms of the smoking attributable cancers, your death um, data already kind of covers that. But how do we think about that in a world that's a little more modern where we've got relatively different risk products that are all on the market at the same time? So um, I think there's sort of two parts to this, or maybe three. So um, our estimates are sort of net of any substitution. Many, but not all of the cigarette taxes um, were enacted with other tobacco taxes at the same time. So when that happens, I think most of the substitution is to non-use rather than to an alternative form. But for a pure cigarette tax, for sure you'd expect the substitution. 
my view, and I, I think um, Catherine and others in the audience are more the experts on this, is that um, cigarette taxes today are, are likely to push people towards um, vaping as well as abstinence. Um, and there's some um, trade-offs there, like probably the health consequences of vaping are much better than smoking, but not as good as um, abstinence. Um, my gut, although I think we would want evidence on this, my gut is that um, the possibility of substituting to vaping means that taxes are more effective at discouraging smokers because there's a close substitute nearby. So um, that possibility of substitution suggests maybe even bigger um, health effects than, than in historical periods where there weren't sort of healthier close substitutes. Okay, I probably should go. Um, I, I would love to Thank hear more feedback much. and answer questions I can over email or, or otherwise. Thank you, Dan. Okay, I think we are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, his co-authors who jumped into the Q&A, oh, our moderator Thanks, and our guest discussant. Finally, thank you to our audience of 277 people for your participation. Hope you have a top notch weekend.